Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Happy Sunday morning. It's a privilege to be here as we worship together our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ just one more time. I would ask if you all would just stand with uh, us again as we prepare for our call to worship. Can the church say amen? Yeah. Amen. Let us come together and worship the Lord. Let us praise our How, go How good is it to live together in unity? The Lord blesses our lives seated and welcome on this wonderful Sunday morning. As you might have noticed, we've made a little change in the way we're singing our opening song. We're going to sing the same one all month long so that they can have time to work on other new songs so we can build our repertoire songs. So that was one of the things to help us work on new songs is we're going to sing the same song four times or five times, depending. But it's a good, fun song to start with. Um, if you could sign the attendance pads and pass them down, that would be great. Thank you for doing that. Right 9 o'clock at the top, if you're the first person or if you're the second person, the first one already signed. Our prayer focus this week is for the hurricane season coming up. Uh, it seems like California is getting a very rare hurricane that's hitting them. I think it's only the second or third in history to hit California, so keep them in your prayers. We've got like four potential storms right now out there, but I don't think any of them are going to affect us based on the long-term forecasts. But they're going to affect somebody, although two of them are going to go out the Atlantic and just disturb the fish. But there is one heading possibly to Texas, and we're not sure where the other one's going to come up through. So just be in prayer for this, that somebody is going to be affected by a hurricane this year. They always are, so just keep that in your prayers. 
Uh, tomorrow we'll be praying here. If you'd like to gather with us at 8.30, we meet over in this corner of the sanctuary. Uh, we have a time of prayer, and you're, anybody is welcome to join us. Uh, next Sunday is Coffee with the Pastor. If you're interested in membership or anything about the church, we'll be meeting right after the 9 o'clock service, somewhere about 10.10. 10. Uh, just mill over there where the door says office, and I'll find you, and we'll sit down in my office, and we can talk. And if you'd like to make donations to the fire in Hawaii, we finally got word from the bishop of the California Pacific uh, Conference of how to get that money there, where it's going to do, how it'll be funneled through. It's going to be funneled through a lot of the churches in that area. So if you would like to make a contribution, just uh, make a contribution, put up fire on there, something like that. Um, but we did get that information through our, um, our conference office of where we can send the money. And also, uh, we're looking to do some mailings to our active military families, and so we need their addresses. Jan Lambert heads that up. Um, right over there. Hi, Jan. <laughs> and so if you have family that's over, um, deployed or just somewhere, let them know. They don't have to be deployed overseas, just that they're in the military. We want to send letters to them. And also, all the kids that are going off to college and um, other kids that are in college, we'd like their addresses because we want to send them letters, too, during the school year, so we need their addresses too, so thank you for that. And satellite football season has started. It will start the first official game this Friday. They had a, a preseason find out what's wrong with the team by playing Coco. <laughs> um, and they found a lot that they need to work on because uh, you go play one of the top teams in the state and you'll learn what you're doing wrong. And they came out and they have things that they're going to work on. <laughs> that, but the first game is the, the season's this Friday. It's a home game. So we need help with people with parking. If you can help with that, see Charles right up here because we do need people to help with that. And there's only four home games this year because of a weird thing of one of the coaches that left. They kind of messed it up. Usually you do five home, five away. This year, they're doing four home and six away. So we only have four home games, but we do need help because people park all over the place. And also, there's a new state law that we just found out about Friday um, that they told the coach, or the coach told us, if you are going to be around the team doing anything, they have to submit, we have, the football team has to submit their names of those people to the state. And so I've got to do that Monday. So if you think at all that you want to possibly be a sub or help with the football needs, I need to get your name on that list. Otherwise, you won't be able to help at all during the season. So I need that by the end of today so I can give that into the morning. So a lot of you have already responded to the email I sent out, and thank you for that. So I don't know what happened that required a state law to be written that those who would be around the football team have to be identified at the beginning of the season. But something happened somewhere, and it upset somebody, and they passed a law. That's how most of our laws get passed. So with that, then, let us stand and greet one another. Wave and say hi, and we'll continue worshiping.
rest on His unchanging praise. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ
He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are an unstoppable God, that your love never ends. It is always continuing, always coming to us. Your grace is always flowing. 
Your forgiveness is ever present. And we come this morning thanking you that you surround us with this grace, this forgiveness, this hope, this power, this love and purpose in our lives so that we might live an abundant life. And we thank you for that calling on our lives. We thank you for all the blessings of this life you give us. And so, Lord, we just here to praise your name. Lord, as we come here, we're approaching that time of year where the hurricanes start to get more powerful. And we do lift up the people in California, Lord, who are bracing for an unprecedented storm that will bring tremendous flooding. And so, Lord, we just ask for your protection of the people there. Lord, let your presence be known in the midst of this storm. Let your love shine through the people. The Lord, protect those. And Lord, here on our coast, we know that there are storms that are brewing out there and more to come this season. Lord, you're the one who can divert them away from causing great harm. So Lord, just protect the people in the paths of these hurricanes. Continue to show us how we might be one in response to the aftermath. Because, Lord, we build our homes in their paths, and we just want to be with each other when they do come. So help us to be loving people who come to help those in need. And, Lord, we even still lift up those that are dealing with the wildfires in Hawaii, on Maui. Lord, there's so much to just put their lives back together. So many people just wondering what this year is going to be, what their future is going to be. And so, Lord, we just ask your blessings upon them. To all those that are coming to bring aid and resources, Lord, bless them. But bless the people who have been affected, Lord. Help them to rebuild their lives. Bring restoration to their lives, Lord. Because we know that you are the God of restoration. Lord, as we come here this morning, we also lift up those that are hurting those that need your healing, your strength. We lift up all of those, Lord, on our prayer list. You know their needs, Lord. Just touch them as only you can. And Lord, we even now lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up the ministries of this church. As much of the people, children have gone back to school and we just ask that you bless our ministries with the school. Continue to show how we might touch the lives of the students there. Continue to show us how we might touch the lives of the people in this area and even those who live outside of it and those worldwide. Bless our missions, Lord. Bless the work we do because we want to do your work. So open our eyes to the work you've called us to to the people you've called us to reach and touch. We thank you for the ministries you've given us, Lord, and give us the strength and the resources to continue to do these ministries in your love and in your power because we want to go and share that love and to make disciples, your disciples. So help us to be that church, Lord, to be your people. And we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ who makes everything we do possible who brings us grace and forgiveness and power and purpose. And we thank you that he took all of our sins away from us so that we don't have to worry about that, that he's given us hope and new life. And we thank you that he rose again and taught us to pray this prayer. We now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church. They'll go through the double doors there and return at the end of the service. And we'll continue singing. Breaks 
Welcome Rick Riley up there playing the guitar. He's coming. And we have plenty of room for singers. And I know they're out there. You just got to step up, be bold, be brave, and we will love you. <laughs> we do not throw tomatoes. We sing with you. So take courage. We need some singers. When we come to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings, and one of our offerings is ourselves, our talents, our gifts. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about. We don't give just our money. We give our service. We do things that God has called us to do. And um, in the newsletter, I I think I talked about last week, I've I've got an article in there. We've done, we finished the last project with our capital campaign that was uh, started in 2016, raising the money. The original capital campaign said there were 13 projects that they wanted to do. We ended up touching on 19 different projects with that money, even though we got in a lot less money than we want, hoped for to do all the projects. We didn't do everything we dreamed of, but we were able to leverage that money with different things. We were able to leverage it with a grant from the city. The city gave us $35,000, and we added with it to do our playground to get that there. With the PPP loan, we were able to take money that we would have paid for 
uh, staff the money we did have, allowed that money to pay for that, that freed up money for us to do other things. We leveraged that with some of the capital campaign. The preschool has gotten a grant, and we've been able to leverage some of the money with that to do some things. So God has blessed us. When, when the money comes in, it's amazing how God will bring things to leverage that with us, to bless that, to add to it. So I thank you for all you gave to the capital campaign. And we still do have a, uh, our addition we did to the Fellowship Hall Community Outreach Center. We still have a mortgage on that. So don't forget to not give to that. We're kind of holding our own and the money comes in to make the payments right now. So um, we do have things that we're still doing. And our, our community outreach center is being used a lot by different outside groups. The high school, they use it for different events in there. Uh, the baseball team does their year-end banquet in there. The basketball team does their year-end banquet in there. I think the cheerleaders do a year-end banquet in there. And other groups, the city has used it for town hall meetings and things like that. So people come in and they see that now and they get a better impression of who we are. And it's a way we reach out to the community because our church, we're centrally located in Satellite Beach. We are kind of a hub here. Our parking lot is used by everybody. <laughs> it is the meeting place for the community. And many of the kids come here to play. So um, we touch this community in many ways. And through your giving, we are able to continue that. So thank you. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you placed us here many, many years ago to touch this community. And Lord, you've blessed this church over and over. And you've blessed the people of this church. And we thank you for those blessings. And Lord, now as we come to return a portion of that blessing back to you so that we might bless this community, we ask that you use these resources, guide us in their use, multiply them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Genesis, the 45th chapter, beginning the first verse. Hear now these words. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you, for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry up and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen. And you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt, and all that you have seen, hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And while went, Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
I don't know how many of you are fans of Calvin and Hobbes. My son is a big fan of Calvin and Hobbes. In fact, he quoted Calvin and Hobbes in his valedictorian speech at his graduation. But one of the recurring themes in the comic strip was Calvin was constantly teasing or picking on a girl named Susie. And in one cartoon, Calvin says to his tiger friend Hobbes, I feel bad that I called Susie names and hurt her feelings. I'm sorry I did it. Hobbes replies back, maybe you should apologize to her. Calvin is then seen pondering this for a moment and then says, I'm, I keep hoping there's a less obvious solution. When we deal with forgiveness and grace, sometimes we're like Calvin. We don't want to give it out. We don't want to ask for it. See, asking for forgiveness, giving for forgiveness and grace, they're all foundational parts of our faith. It is part of how we live as disciples of Jesus Christ. And these things do not require others to buy into it for us to do them. It seems like sometimes if we're offering forgiveness, the other person should be into it. But that's not always the case. You might have heard the phrase, you know, it takes two to tango. That phrase actually comes from a 1952 song where the kind of chorus says, you can sail in a ship by yourself, take a nap or a nip by yourself. You can get into debt on your own. There are lots of things you can do alone, but it takes two to tango. And that's because there's a movement. And there's a lot of things that do take two. Marriages, it takes two to be in a healthy marriage, not just one. It takes two to be in any kind of relationship. But when it comes to grace, that's something we can do alone. It's something God has done for us alone, whether we accept it or not. And we can forgive people whether they accept it or not. And we can ask forgiveness of people whether they give it or not. It's something we are called to do. And we don't worry about how the other will respond. It's what are we doing? But too often we're like this little girl who fought with her friend. Her mother heard about the quarrel and talked with her about it. And she tried to show her daughter that she was wrong and that she needed to ask God's forgiveness for getting into a fight with her friend. So the little girl knelt down to pray, and, and she prayed, oh God, please forgive me for getting angry and quarreling with Charlotte. And mother thought, okay, she got the message. She's thinking that. But then her daughter kind of changed things a little bit, for she prayed, and make Charlotte come to me and ask my forgiveness, O oh Lord. Give her no rest until she is sorry and comes and tells me so. See, I think that's sometimes how we, when we're wronged, we want to act. <laughs> we, Lord, I'm not going to forgive them until they come and ask for it. And they got to come on their knees and humbly ask for it. I don't think this is how God wants us to respond to his grace and his forgiveness. See, we're to take what God freely offers us, freely gives us, and turn around and give it to others. That's what it means to be a disciple. And we see that in the story, we see this in the story of Joseph, but we see Joseph's struggle. Last week I said that from chapter 37 to the end of Genesis chapter 50, Joseph is the main character. And we see the many twists and turns that happen in Joseph's life. He is blessed and then troubles comes. This is the pattern. But through it all, he keeps his faith in God. He keeps his trust in God. And we see him when he goes down to Egypt. He's blessed for a while, but then he's a falsely accused and he's thrown into prison. And he stays in prison quite some time, even though he defends people who forget about him. But eventually, through revelations that God has given him, he becomes overseer of the greatest humanitarian task of that time, helping that region survive a seven-year drought, a drought that has now touched the lives of Joseph's family back in Canaan. And they have heard that there is food in Egypt, and so Israel sent his sons to Egypt to buy grain. And when they arrive, they have to stand before and bow down to none other than their brother they wanted to kill, but they don't recognize him at first. They don't even think he's alive. And so for chapters 42, 43, and 44, 
We read the suffering that Joseph put his brothers through, his fathers through, how he played with them, toyed with them, he accused them of being spies. He had two of the brothers remain behind, one at one time they came down, one when they came down a second time. He planted a cup in their bags and accused them of stealing it. Basically, he was being a jerk. And some would say, well, they deserved it for what they did to him. We read, even read in Genesis 42, 21 through 22, this is what the brothers thought was happening. We read, they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give accounting, an accounting for his blood. I think we struggle. It's hard to forgive. It's hard to show grace when you've been wronged. Because I think there's something about evil that captivates us. There's something about we want to see someone get their just desserts. No matter what end on we are, we like this negative, this dark side. In The Divine Intruder, James Edwards writes about our captivation of evil. He said, in imaginary works, it's difficult to make virtuous characters as believable and attractive as bad characters. The villains of literature and screen, Captain Ahab, the boys that go bad in The Lord of the Rings, Darth Vader, Norman Bates, Hannibal the Cannibal, are all, as a rule, larger figures, more gripping and more memorable than are the heroes and heroines of even the same authors and producers. He said, this is true in religious literature as it is a secular literature. In Paradise Lost, Milton Satan has all the good lines. But who remembers a word of the Christ, of his Christ? Dante's The Divine Comedy is one of the great masterpieces of world literature, yet literary critics as well as college freshmen rarely read the Paradiso. And those who do usually judge its virtue and bliss flat and insipid compared to the gargoyled voices of the inferno. We're in, we love evil characters. There's something in us that identifies with them. And then he, this is what he goes on to say. There's a good reason why this is so. Human nature stands closer to evil than to good. Intrigue, scheming, and deception are more instinctual to us than love, goodness, and forgiveness. The vice is our first nature, so to speak, whereas virtue is a second nature. Either a learned response or no response at all. He says, it's easier to figure out ways to cheat the IRS than solve problems of hunger or violence. When we are wrong, we can hatch 10 brilliant schemes of revenge, but try and devise even a paltry plan for redeeming a bad situation is difficult. I think the world we live in today we are looking to be victims. We're looking to be victims of evil rather than redeemers of good. We want people punished instead of seeing people redeemed. But God is in the grace business, and he calls to be his, us to be in that business too. And there are times that we see that people overcame hurts of their past to forgive, John Cohen shared this story about a pardon from Missouri Governor Stewart. He was the governor back in 1857 to 1861. And he recognized a convict he was about to pardon. He recognized this convict was a steamboat mate under whom he served as a captain boy. And as he's addressing this convict before he pardons him, he says, I want you to promise that you will never again take a stick of wood and drive a sick boy out of his berth on a stormy night because someday that boy may become governor and you may want him to pardon you for another crime. I was that boy and here is your pardon. It takes a lot to overcome the hurt that's been done to us because we want to see vengeance, not grace. Grace. But there's power in grace, so much greater than any vengeance. There's power in trusting God in the face of persecution and trouble. And people want grace in their lives. I remember reading this story about a woman named Marga Hanita Lasky. I probably butchered her name. 
Um, she was a writer and a poet in England. And one of her noted contributions is she had 250,000 additions to the Oxford English Dictionary over her lifetime. But she was an avowed atheist. But shortly before her death, she made this statement. She said, what I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. There's power in forgiveness. There's power in grace. And that power brings life. It renews life. It brings hope to those lost in their wrongs. And it's so easy to withhold, especially when the wrong is called so much pain, but we are called to be people who forgive. We can see that in Joseph, he was struggling. He wanted revenge so bad. And he began to enact it at each time. But in the end, he knew that he must forgive. And in this life, we're going to come across those times where we have a choice to love or to hate. Christ taught us that choosing love is the most powerful response. We're reminded over and over of that, that love has within it a redemptive power. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Because if you hate your enemies, there's no way to redeem them. No way to transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. That there is hope for reconciliation, for change in people's life. But if you hate people, you just push them further away. See, that's the power of grace. It helps to bring redemption. And that truth is seen most clearly in the life of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus came to reveal God's character and purpose to us. He suffered injustice. He suffered imprisonment, torture, and even death in order to defeat the power of death. But in that, he reconciled us to God and offers us eternal life. And in Joseph's story, we see a foreshadowing of the faithful obedience and redemptive love of Jesus Christ. In their Bible Project podcast, host Tim Mackey and John Collins make this point. They say, in every way, Joseph is an image of God's anointed one. Through his suffering, a remnant of God's people is preserved. Through his faithfulness, Blessings go out to all nations, and he even forgives his brothers who tried to kill them. That's what we're called to be in that grace business, that forgiveness business. The Reverend Dr. Michael Brown of Marble Colgate Church in New York tells a story about how this redemptive love of Jesus can heal the pains of the past in both the victim and the offender's life. Reverend Brown has the greatest respect for a pastor he grew up knowing. He describes this pastor as a friend of his father's, as one of the kindest, gentlest human beings he ever knew. And the pastor had once confessed to Reverend Brown's father that he had grown up with a stepmother who abused him both physically and emotionally. One of the things he shared is sometimes in her anger, she would lock him outside the, in the yard all night long. He said he would bang on the door, crying and begging to be let in, and no matter how bad the weather conditions were outside, she wouldn't let him in. And the next morning, she would not give him any breakfast and then rush him off to school. Well, many years later, when the stepmother was dying and all her biological children basically abandoned her because she was not the brightest, nicest person, he decided to take care of her by moving her into his own home. And he cared with her with love and compassion until she did the day she died. When Reverend Brown's father heard this, he says, I can't believe you did that for her after how she treated you. This is what the pastor said. He said, I didn't do it just for her. I also did it for myself. I reached a point where the burden of resentment was too heavy to carry around anymore. I couldn't be free of the pain till I was free of the hatred. And I also decided if I cannot love people who make loving difficult, how can I ever stand in a pulpit and preach about love to anyone else? And that's one of the greatest powers of grace. It frees us from the cancer of hatred inside us 
when we've been wronged and we just carry that wrong for year after year, and the person who wronged us probably doesn't even think about it. All we're doing is hurting ourselves. But when we offer grace and forgiveness, we release that pain in us. See, there's the power in giving grace as we have received God's grace. It's one of the greatest miracles that happens in life when we forgive, when we love. And our country needs people of grace more than ever today. There's little grace in our country today, but there's many Christians, so there should be a lot of grace in our world today. Take hold of the grace offered to you by God and share that grace with the people you encounter every day, including those who wrong you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you offer us grace. That we, when he sinned against you, you did not hold it against us. When we do the things you don't want us to do, you don't hold it against us. When we don't do the things you want us to do, you don't hold it against us. You offer us grace and love. You offer us encouragement to go and live and try again. You offer us a relationship. And so, Lord, help us to be the same kind of disciples who offer your grace, your love, your redemption, who look to resolve and restore rather than to hate and divide. Help us to be that kind of people. Help us to be that kind of church because we can only do it in your power and your strength. And we thank you for Christ who gives us that power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
As we prepare to leave, let us reach up and grab God's hand because he's going to walk with you and he's going to love you. And he's going to give you the power of his grace to share with the world. So go and be people of grace. Be people of forgiveness and share that forgiveness and grace and love with the world and change the world. Amen.